welcome to From Page to Screen. Uh, I will be your moderator today. My name is Heather Reesby. I am a uh, PR director for Tolari Press, a small local company that publishes genre fiction. And we will be discussing how to take your book from the page to the silver screen. And to help us discuss this, we have three amazing people with us. Uh, on my right, we have Lorna Suzuki, author, John Gallagher, conceptual artist, and Kelly Young, a uh, screenwriter, and I will let them do further introductions. Um, do you want to start? Go right ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yes, my name is Lorna Suzuki, and I write young adult fantasy, uh, The Dream Merchant Saga, and the movie option series I write is called The Imago Chronicles, and when I'm not writing fantasy, I'm actually a martial arts instructor, and uh, I, that's about it. Your turn. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, John Gallagher. I was one of the founders of BioWare. I started out in video games. I was there for almost a decade. I transitioned to uh, designing for film and TV in 2008, and I've been doing it ever since. And uh, I own a comic store back in Edmonton called Happy Harbor, so if you're ever in Edmonton, please drop by. And uh, yeah, this is the greatest thing you can possibly imagine, coming to these conventions. I was just reminiscing that it used to be in rooms this size, and it's a delightful thing to see. So thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Kelly Young. I've written a couple of films based on H.P. Lovecraft stories that won a couple of awards, and I also publish the magazine Strange Eons. I love your magazine. Well, thank you. I didn't know you published that. I published that. It's fantastic. <laughs> so to start with, um, let's start with Lorna. More often than not, an author has very little creative say in what goes from the page to the screen. Um, what has your personal experience been, and do you think that's unusual? Um, I've been actually very fortunate. It's, it's true, most authors have very little say. Most of them are actually squeezed out of the whole process um, with as far as the film production goes. And in my case, I've been fortunate enough that when the movie, the first three books were optioned, the executive producer approached me and said, would you like first crack at the screenplay? And I thought, no way in hell. <laughs> Was I gonna have my you know, screenwriting debut be a multi-million dollar big budget film? Um, instead, she presented me with a list of um, five uh, top Hollywood screenwriters. And instead, I recommended a Canadian, an award-winning screenwriter, Canadian screenwriter, and he did a fabulous job on the on the screenplay. I got to review it. I got to make recommendations. Um, I was asked to also submit a list of my top pick for actors, uh, so that way this the um, casting director can narrow the search down for the principal um, stars in in the show. And I got to recommend an exceptionally talented artist for the project as well. And um, the other thing too, I, I was forewarned by the executive producer because my husband and I, we both do martial arts. We may be involved in working with some of the actors and um, showing them exactly what the female character can do um, in a real fight situation. So there you go. Um, so Kelly, as a screenwriter, uh, working with an author and adapting a screenplay, uh, how much input do you like from the author and do you kind of like to go your own way or do you appreciate such feedback? Well, luckily, my author had been dead since 1937. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, did you uh, still argue with him once in a while? I did not at all, actually. He was very open to all my suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, uh, I haven't adapted anybody's uh, writing besides my own to, to screenplay other than uh, Lovecraft's. So um, the challenge there is that he's a uh, short story writer and, and trying to push a short story, especially his type, into three-act structure was was the big challenge. So, John? Yes. <laughs> as a concept artist, mm -hmm. um, what are the challenges of taking Lorna's words and making images out of them? Well, it's kind of a codified language. Like, for me, um, visual... <laughs> Can you hear that? Am I projecting? <laughs> All right. Um, it's, it's really no different than working with the form language of imagery. I mean, words are essentially codes, and we connect in the same way to words as we do to imagery. And typically, one begets the other, but in my case, I tend to think in words, um, because the majority of 
the work that I do in terms of production design is keyed on words. So we have conversations when we're collaborating. So I didn't have to really learn any new language. Uh, so the challenges, though, are the same challenges as with every new project. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to get into insipid repetition. So it just becomes another commodified, you know, uh, production line project. You want it to have life. You want it to have a uh, signature look. You want it to have uh, all of these things. You don't want to resort to trope, which we all know that word and we all live that recycled stuff every day. So you try as you can, and they're all battles, guys. So if you ever want to get into film production, every, every single inch of real estate is a fight because it's all consensus and it's all committee and it's all roundtable discussions where often the language gets completely off base all the way around. Right? So by the time you get to the end of the table where you were discussing a cool idea that you had read in the book, you're like, that needs to be in. It gets around to here, it's like, oh yeah, it'll be green and it'll be large. You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so you have to respect the work first and foremost, if I can offer anything as, uh, as an illustrator or designer, you respect the work. And you definitely have active conversation with the creator. It's critical because I'm representing a writer who is transitioning to this new space and uh, trying to make that transition as painless as possible and in as, as inspiring as possible. So we have uh, Lorna, actually Lorna and I met at a show that was actually about this size, uh, VCon, a couple of years ago. And we had a chance to break bread and discuss it. Uh, and I was immediately intrigued because my daughter is 16 and uh, a lot of what I do, I do to inspire her. And uh, that obviously resonated with me that the female protagonist in the story is this feisty little character. And my own daughter is a feisty little character. So uh, there's a level of connection there immediately. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to serve it. And we are serving this project in the best way we can. everything you've done on that project. Um, in a project like that, how do you take something classic and iconic and then bring it to life in a way that makes it applicable to modern audiences that... Oh, you mean in, on one, in Once Upon a Time? time. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, I, think, I think we have the advantage of having Adam and Eddie, who are, con are clever and subversive and funny guys. Like, like they, They're awful, awful... Um, uh, awful in the great sense of like deviant and hilarious and smart, smart, the smartest men in the room. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to kind of subvert. I think it's important that you don't insult your audience. I see far too much work that just kind of condescends to the audience. They're like, yeah, they, they'll never notice. It's the first thing we notice. <laughs> and, and I, I'm a fan first and foremost, and I think it's critical that you respect the work and you respect your audience. And I know maybe that's not common, or maybe it is, uh, but you respect that, you respect your audience, and to give it a fresh twist is, I think you should be uh, literate in the contemporary zeitgeist. You should respect tradition. Uh, like my heroes are Ray Harryhausen and and uh, Jack Kirby and Will Eisner, like those are my heroes, and Ralph McQuarrie. And, but they were the guys that we stood on their shoulders, like Frank Frazetta. Um, but to bring it into contemporary times, you should be literate in uh, the, the modern aesthetic. And by modern aesthetic, I mean across all popular media. You should be aware of what's happening in video games, you should be aware of what's happening in comics, uh, anime, manga, and the list goes on. I realize it's a full-time job by itself, but we're hobbyists and we're passionate and we're hungry for uh, interesting things. And I think it's critical you maintain your hunger. And that's what's interesting about Adam and Eddie is that they are constantly curious. They're endlessly curious about our zeitgeist and how to kind of give it a little bit of a a twist and having the cast that they have, especially I got to go on record. Robert Carlyle's the coolest guy in the world. <laughs> he is like the literally the coolest guy in the world. Uh, 
and every bit is as badass as you'd expect it would be. And um, I think it's it's very important that it translate to modern audiences and also connect to uh, tradition, if, if you can, if you can bridge that gap. But again, I don't know if I answered the question. I, I think I'm that actually, I okay. think that actually could be applicable to to Kelly and to Luna as well, because with Kelly, with adapting Lovecraft, how do you make that applicable to modern audiences? I mean, he's a classic, but a lot of people don't appreciate the classics the way that maybe they should. And with Lorna, the high fantasy is, you know, you get Tolkien, you get all these other great authors. How do you take from that but not be consumed by that so that it still stays relevant? Should I go Please. first? Please. Uh, with Lovecraft, we had to kind of toe the line He's gotten more popular, but when we were starting doing this, very few people had heard of him. And still, in the big picture, he's, you know, my mom doesn't know who H.P. Lovecraft is. And that's kind of what I base whether the general world is going to understand what we're doing or not. So you're trying to, uh, to please the hardcore fans. You're trying to, usually in his stories, bring them <coughs> up to date, set them in present time. And then you're trying to interest a film company into thinking that they can actually hit a broader audience with it and make some money off of it. So, yeah, it's, it's a huge juggle. I don't know that we've successfully done it. Um, the last film that we did was a short film where I said, let's just take the idea that he's got, and I just want to hit three scares in this movie, and I want the, the audience to leave and go, that was really creepy, and not necessarily think it was a, a word-for-word -word adaptation. And then I won Best Adaptation at the Lovecraft Film Festival for that film. So, but I don't know what that means because our first <laughs> film was a fantastic adaptation that nobody liked. <laughs> well, um, if I can comment to that, uh, I had the opportunity to talk with um, Guillermo del Toro about uh, At the Mountains of Madness and some of the challenges he faced. And if it's any consolation to anybody, He's a super stud, and he faced the same challenges with Lovecraft, that while we all reference it uh, in, in the modern uh, design parlance, they still don't get it. They just kind of go, what, cosmology, what, what, cosmicism? I don't, I don't understand, it's too complex. Uh, but yeah, he, and he and James Cameron couldn't get a film made, and if him and James Cameron can't get a film made, <laughs> I, under, I appreciate the ordeal and the challenge, and it is so in, such inspiring work. I'm not I'm not sure why exactly it uh, doesn't resonate with studio exec. Come on. Yeah. I really don't know what to say as far as uh, H.P. Lovecraft goes. Um, um, you know, because I I do write epic high fantasy. Um, for me, you know, as John said, th there's the mistake of following that stereotypical, follow you called it trope. It's right? a trope because yeah, it and, falls into cliche. Yeah, and, and we start to go, uh, oh, I felt mm -hmm. this story. Yeah, and for me, what I did is, if you get a chance to read the first book in the Imago series, it's almost heads in the total different direction. It, it feels like Lord of the Rings. Uh, it was actually pitched to the film industry as Lord of the Rings in 300 Meets the Last Samurai. Um, and thank God, because I love all those movies. So that was a good thing. Um, but it took a different twist in that it kind of went the opposite route. And, and, and even the characters are quite different. Um, you know, like the elves, for example, um, I, th I think Lord of the Rings. Yeah, they're all, the, in Lord of the Rings, the elves are very slender and, you know, they're woodland creatures that can kill you, but they're very slender um, types. And, and when I described the elves in my books to John, um, you know, I said, you know what, mine are not legless, like mine are, have evolved through years, centuries of war. And right away he knew that they were going to be built like Spartans. Lots of eye candy for the women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not uh, dainty. Yes, no, they're not engines dainty. of destruction, which I think encourages a lot of fans of of high fantasy. I think you know this room certainly represents a cross section 
of our audience out there, and I think we certainly do as well. And being aware of all that, I love to pander to an audience. I love to give them exactly what they want. And uh, I make no apologies for it. I think, you know, if you want lots of buff guys walking around with pointy ears, have at it, man. <laughs> Load that stuff up. Lots of black spiky armor and scaring everyone. That's great. Let's do it. It's a lot of fun. So whenever I hear that... Uh book that I love is being made into a movie. I usually get excited and then also feel trepidation about it because I know a lot of it's going to change. And, mm -hmm. and John, you're saying that you have to respect the work, but so often it seems like it, the work is respected when it comes. So why do you think that is? Why don't more, um, when they make it into a movie, why don't they consult the author more? Why don't they? Well, I think I, I'll let Lorna answer that, then I can answer it from my position, and then... Apparently, um, like, basically with a number of authors, they have a very, very difficult time handing the work over, especially if they've never done screenplays before, because a screenplay and a novel are two very, very different animals. Um, for me, uh, when I write, it's almost like I'm writing from this part of, you know, like I'm working from, from a screen this big in my mind where, you know, when I hand it over to someone like John, he takes what I write down and see this, he makes it, you know, for the big screen. But the, apparently, according to my um, entertainment lawyer who deals with a lot of authors and books and, and he knows the business. He said the biggest difficulty a lot of studios have when an author steps in, they don't want to let go and they cannot understand why it cannot be page for page the same. It can't be, especially when you have a big epic novel unless you have four hours to dedicate to, you know, something like that. It, it usually won't happen and an author sometimes can raise such a fuss that they can even get themselves ejected from the film set. That, that's fair enough, but sometimes I see things added to movies that weren't in the book that doesn't make any sense from that end. You know what, I, I've been very fortunate this way because the executive producer, she spent a lot of time trying to option um, the rights to this. Um, I don't know if you're going to read the press release later about who the doc, who the director or um, the co-producer is, but um, you know, it, it, it's difficult to, you know, for an author to just hand over the work sometimes, and a lot of times, because a, a director and producer they can see the bigger picture. Sometimes these additions aren't necessarily bad things. You know, if they can take my my words and my characters and, and make them bigger and better than even what's on the page, it's like, hey, more power to them. And, and the thing is, too, when you hand over something like this, you have to allow the director and the producer and someone like John a certain amount of uh, creative license to, to run with it and, and you know, c contribute to, to it. And I think it can also make for a much more improved thing. So that's what I'm, that's what we're aiming for, a bigger and better imago. Some, sometimes, yes, it doesn't always work, though. Yeah, it doesn't always, but you know what, I'm, I'm very lucky I can have a voice in, in what's going on, so. Uh, I'm take, or you want to go? Uh, I, I, can, I can only speak from my position where typically I'm translating directly from a script. Uh, that's what I do all the time. And, or if I'm just working on personal work, it's obviously a different animal. Uh, but when it comes to reading a script, um, you have to hit your notes and your beats. And you start out, like we kind of, uh, in the process, we never aim for the bottom. And, you know, as, as concept artists, I have a sheet of, of electronic full scap, and I'm still the same eight-year-old kid trying to fill it with cool stuff. And typically it comes down, um, unfortunately, so a lot of the compromises have little to do with anyone intentionally subverting the source material. I can say that with, with, uh, with truth in my heart. At least in the art department, let me qualify that. Uh, we don't set out to make anything suck. <laughs> we don't. Uh, sometimes it does. Uh, not in my art department, though. 
but but we don't we we don't aim to kind of hit the middle, uh, and it always comes down to a number of the same factors: uh, resources, finances. Uh, if you can sell the idea up the river, um, if stakeholders are committed to seeing that beat or that moment. Uh, and it rarely has anything to do with not wanting to respect the material. Although there are, and I will qualify this, and I don't care if it goes on record, there are a number of um, producers, uh, which I'm fortunate not to have to work with, uh, <laughs> that uh, will often take uh, huge liberties with the material because they hate it. Uh, they speak the language of hatred and contempt and disregard, and it's often for the sake of money. And you go, well, that's nice, because I, like, as I said earlier, I'm a fan first, and I need to see that material given uh, full respect and consideration. And uh, as far as the, I guess, what would we be talking about? Um, the enhancements. I, when I read when when I read Lorna's uh, book, I read the book first and then the screenplay, and obviously there's significant differences. The connective tissue is identical, uh, the genome is the same, but in terms of what the screenplay says to you and what the, the novel says to you, I like that I got to read both. Often you don't have that choice when you're working in TV. There is no book. So, or film for that matter, it's often not based on anything other than original material. So I had that advantage. And both of them inspired me in different ways. And I think Lorna could say that I probably nailed a few right off the jump, just because the material's fresh and interesting. And then it goes down the line, and then everybody's fingerprints get the fun. And that's when it start, can occasionally start to get weird and lose its, lose its way or lose the plot. Unfortunately, film is a business that there's lots of people who should not be making decisions in any meaningful way. And please put that up. <laughs> it's the whole cam a camel is supposed to be by committee type thing. And, and yeah, I mean, anything that you've probably read uh, and that you've experienced, we live, you know, the internet's delightful because it's always right. <laughs> and we always fact check. Uh, but Often, when it comes to the insider stuff, they're, they're dead on. And uh, it's often bizarre and petty and strange reasons for things. And it often has nothing to do with the material itself. It's about the deal. And unfortunately, what ends up as fans, and I'm right there with you, I go see it and go, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> How could you miss the obvious? Um, so they do the best they can. We all do. And eventually, hopefully, some of it clues together and makes it to the final cut and looks fantastic. And fans are like, yeah, you nailed it. We do the very best we can. And it's a war of attrition. It really is. Also, it, it absolutely is a business. And they're looking at it as a business, not necessarily art. So. The latest issue of Batman sells 140,000 copies at 3.99, but the last Batman movie sold 52 million tickets at between eight and fifteen dollars. And they're going to look at that and say, "Who are we most interested in in making like this movie? The comic book fan base or the people who come to movies? Because yeah. the comic book fans are going to show up to that movie whether it's awful or not." <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that. Thank you. So, Kelly, I know that you said you hadn't adapted any material from living authors as yet, but can you think of anything that you, story-wise, would love to get your hands on? I've been lobbying, and maybe it'll happen now since it's a big deal, uh, to get an animated version of The King in Yellow going. And oh. True Detective has brought that into everybody's Dude, mindset. We're talking finally. after this. So, <laughs> uh, so that, that's one I'd really like to get a hold of. I think that that book is, is very readable still. It, it's not like Lovecraft, which was stilted even when he was writing it. Um, and I think it's a solid source material, a really neat mythos, and you know, unlike anything that's out there right now. 
John, is there anything you would particularly love to put your fingerprints on? You know what? I have a list that's as long as both of our arms and wrap around this room. <laughs> uh, I think um, I'm fortunate that I get to work on a lot of what I would be doing in my spare time. I, mean, I can't wait to get cracking on something like this. I think uh, there's so much material here. There's so much material here, and it's a combination of all the. It's a convergence. Oh. <laughs> it's a convergence of all my, um, all my interests, and if I can stay working in genre, and I know that's a genre, it's so despicable. Uh, I, for the rest of my career, I would be, I would die a happy man, because uh, it's the most invigorating, exciting, interesting place to work. Um, I couldn't imagine doing a doors and windows show like a hugger mugger show. It would drive me nuts. I go crazy. I need lasers and aliens <laughs> and things that lurk in the dark, you know, like all of you do. <laughs> go ahead with your question. Lorna, how could you be so sure that the theme of your writing could be directly and correctly reflected through the film, and how would you suggest being like taking control of that? Um, you know what? It, it's worked into my contract. Um, I was actually, I've been hired on as a creative consultant because they felt um, when you find out who the producer is, there's a chance if it does well in the box office, it could become a franchise. If it does, there's 10 novels in my series. And the executive producer actually flew me um, from Vancouver into Toronto when she first wanted to engage me in optioning the rights um, to reassure me that she was going to do right by this, um, and you know we had a very detailed discussion of what was going to happen. And I said, you know, I want to make it perfectly clear: if you turn Nayla Treborn into Xena Warrior Princess, I will have to kill all of you and everyone involved. <laughs> And actually, Lorna could. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure she could take out most of this room without breaking a sweat. But, I mean, for, for them, they realize, because there's so many books, and if they want to continue on, on the, the producer made it very clear she wants to stay as true to the character and the heart of the story as she can. Um, you know, and she, we have a very good working relationship in, in the fact that we communicate well in terms of what we expect. And she knows that in order to um, maintain that integrity, the only way of doing that was to bring me on and, and have me there to make sure, okay, if we kill this person, then it's going to affect the storyline down the line. And, and in fact, at one point, I told her um, I was going to kill the female character off. Um, I think it was in the fourth, fifth book, maybe. Um, and she said, don't you dare. And my literary agent at the time said, don't you do that either. And my husband said, are you nuts? Your fans are going to be very upset with you. And it turned out when I approached a, a number of the fans you know, and said, I'd like to do this. I'd like to kill her off. They were livid. They were so, I was like, it was not a good thing. They were very angry. So 10 books later, um, you know, I, I ended up killing a number of other characters um, that she, she was tied into to the point where, you know, my daughter refers to me now as a serial killer. Um, but it, it's one of those things where the, the producer understands that in order to maintain a certain amount of integrity in the stories and to make sure you know, we follow a certain line and people don't actually get knocked off that's actually needed later on. Uh, don't, it's all up here. You know, they've only optioned the three books right now. Um, so if they want to continue on, then we'll play another game and do more contracts and things like that. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things too. And I, I, it comes down to, to trust as well um, with the producers and, and, you know, even with, John tr trusting, handing the work over to John and him doing that level of work, it, it comes down a lot to trust. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Um, have you ever, uh, this is more for Lorna and then a follow-up question for all of you guys. Have you ever started to write a book or think of an idea and then you start writing it and then you're like, oh, this sounds too much like this book or too much like this movie. And then my follow-up question is, when you guys read a book or you have a screenplay, um, is there ever times where you want to change a little so that's more unique for the screens? 
You know, for for me, um, with the young adult one that I, I co-write with my daughter, Nia, who's standing back there, um, she we actually looked at, because Nia is such an avid reader, she just devours books, and she really knows what she likes. And, and she talks to a lot of friends who, who read and, and love books. And, she, you know, we would sit down and brainstorm and, and talk about, you know, what works with, with people of her age. And it's quite interesting because um, a lot of people who are reading the young adult books are men. I was really surprised. It's, it's men who have been telling me how much they love the dream merchant. And it's kind of like a twist on a fairy tale. It's, it, uh, it's been described as Ella Enchanted meets the Princess Bride. And it's totally a different take. It's a much more humorous bend on, on um, fantasy than Imago is. Where Imago, I mean, if you look at the characters and the journey, yes, they're on a quest not unlike Lord of the Rings, a lot of fantasies involve a quest, but the thing is, how do you turn that adventure, give it a twist to make it different from everything else out there? And in my case, because, I mean, I never read, I'm, I feel ashamed saying this, but I never read Lord of the Rings. I never did either. I, I love I Peter tried. Jackson's take on Lord of the Rings, but I ended up doing the opposite. opposite. Um, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, the way the characters approach this quest and, um, you know, their failings and all these other things. It, it, it's, you look at what's out there and you try to do the opposite thing. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, I had a very similar experience to your mentioning about putting a twist on something. Uh, I was working with a, a group, and if you ever want to produce, it takes five years to build a team, so they know, and I was at the end of the fifth year. And I wanted to do a Hellraiser film, but a large, baroque, huge Hellraiser film, and by huge, I mean 50, 60, 70 million dollars, which is unprecedented for a horror film, by the way. And uh, what ends up happening after you have this great idea and you put together your treatment and you start working on the screenplay is you have to get what's called chain of title. And uh, at that time, Dimension owned it, and they still do. And that's run by the notorious Weinstein brothers. And they had very particular rules about a Hellraiser film. And they're like, well, it's got to be under $3 million. You come up with all the money. We own everything. We're dollar one earners. And it listed, It was a list uh, of basically everything you never want to do with your project. And so we said, well, we've got this really cool story. And we've got all these great characters and these wonderful moments. Uh, why don't we change it? So H.P. Lovecraft, being a public domain, we kind of moved it over towards Lovecraft with some uh, conspiracy theory thrown in, and now we have a great deal of interest in this new project, which is not Hellraiser, but started out, as some projects often do, uh, as something else entirely. And so it became this, this what we think is a vastly superior animal, uh, but had started out with the intention of being uh, a reboot to a franchise. So there is, that is a very recent example in my own life. Um, so yeah, there it is. I have a question about that. Sure. Um, step up to the microphone. Oh. Um, and um, actually, she's, she's been waiting. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> Sorry. Wait just a second. It's okay. Um, Clyde Barker is going to make a new Hellraiser. He Did, does he have to go through that same Thing. Not at all. Well, he, <laughs> he surrendered all his rights to New Line. Uh, he basically sold his soul to uh, get the first film made. So he really has about as neg much negotiating power as I do. Although he now, because he's the Weinsteins in him, split and had so much animosity for so many years, now he and Bob are whining and dining all over Los Angeles. Uh, and he worked on it. But what ended up happening is Clive saw our treatment and said, wow, that's a and we heard it directly from him that he had seen what we were doing. He was like, I better do a, I better do a Hellraiser movie. Uh, so I can speak to that actually impacting what amounted to a fan film. In essence, uh, he had a look at it at a fairly early stage. 
And his feedback through his agent was, that's fantastic. Uh, I guess we better get on this. And it's obviously far easier for Clive to do it than it would have been for us. And as it turns out, it's a happy accident in the dialectic because we ended up with a project that's significantly, to us anyway, far more interesting than we would have ended up being under the license. So yes, now Clive's pushing forward with uh, Hellraiser film, we'll see how that goes, because I don't think he's a particularly good filmmaker, but he's a great writer, amazing writer, unbelievable writer. Uh, Are you still pursuing the, the budget for your original? Story? No, it actually morgified into a, a series, long form narrative. Mm -hmm. So we found out there was enough material to actually stretch over three or four seasons. We're like, dang, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do with that. Sorry, please. Hi, um, I just recently started to write a bit, and um, I know many of you have mentioned that screenwriting and novel writing very different things. Um, just wondering if, from your perspectives, what are a few of the key differences, um, creatively or even practically, to the approach in writing a novel or adapting it to a screenplay or even writing an original screenplay? I think they're vastly different animals. I think it's much easier to write a screenplay than a novel. I can pump out a screenplay in three months, and I don't know what it takes to do a novel, but it's got to be a year or more, right? Every one of yours is... The first one took me a month. Wow, well, this person writes a lot. <laughs> wow. I take it all back. <laughs> um, I for, screenplay, one, so. for screenplay writing, you need to... Uh, no matter what they tell you, what they're looking for, a three-act structure, you need to know how to hit your beats and on what pages, that kind of stuff. So you don't have um, you don't have the chance to really flesh out your characters like you would in a novel. And uh, but I like that. I like the the ability to go from from idea to to finished product in three months. And I just know that I can't write a novel in a month. So I, I think that. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, sure. that was great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So in terms of the writing, I know, Lorna, you're very, you, you say you have the screen in your mind. Um, how much of that are you able to incorporate? How, how much of your vision do you feel that you get on the page? And I know with screenplays also, you have to be very visual. How much do you feel translates to the page and then onto the big screen? Well, you know what? I, I, I think with, when you write a novel and you look at characters, it's true. You know, you, you do have more of an opportunity to delve into the personality, the character, where once you work with a screenplay, you have, I think you basically gear it to um, an actor bringing it to life, where when you write, you ha your words have to bring the character to life. Where the, I feel like with the screenwriter, they write things that the actors, they're going to write words and things that are going to be brought to life by the actors, where um, for a novelist, the onus is on me to, to do that with my words. So, um, you know, I, my, my novels are probably average about 180,000 words. Um, so they're, they're not puny little things, but at the same time, a lot of it has to do with pacing and keeping the um, for story, story moving forward. Um, you know, it, it's hard to describe. I just kind of write. It's, it, for me, I can only describe it as there's a, I think it's digital and, and high definition in my head running through here. And I just basically, all, it's almost like transcribing um, a piece of history that's kind of playing out in my head. Unfortunately, the characters kept me up. I was up at 4 o'clock this morning, and the characters won't leave me alone. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's just very odd. I mean, that's basically how I write. And, you know, like I said, with, with me, it, writing allows me to um, bring the characters to life with words where, you know, it's, it's different with the screenwriters. I feel that they write words that the actors can you know, bring that character to life. I probably didn't answer the question. <laughs> I think that um, <clears throat> the, the finished product is so different from what I have written originally that I was always very unhappy with it. But 
I came to realize that it's such a collaborative process when you're making a film that I've got something set in my head. As soon as the director reads it, he's, he's bringing in his past and things that he knows about and applying it to what I've written. So already it's one step removed from what I would want to see. Then he, he casts the actors. The actors are now bringing their own things into it. And pretty soon it's completely different than what I saw in my head. The best we can hope for is that it's still good and that it, it captures you know, what, I, what I originally was thinking of with the story. Um, and now I, we had a, a short film play that I thought was so different from what I had written, but still probably the best adaptation of a script I had ever written. And, and everybody loved it, and I thought I would never have cast those people, and I wouldn't have made these decisions uh, in the editing and all that. But it still turned out to be, I thought, the closest adaptation of what I had written ever. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and step forward. Hi there. So I have a novel out, and I got a couple more coming out this year. And like every novelist, you have that dream that uh, you're going to see your stuff on the screen somehow. So I'm really curious, uh, is there any way, is it just purely you got to hope that the right person reads it and contact you, or is there any way you can position your stuff to maybe make it a little more interesting or anything of that nature? Who would you like this answer from? <laughs> Pardon me? Who, whose per perspective would you like this answer from? Well, the any and all is good. <laughs> I mean, Anyone you, that has one. You know, in... in, in in terms of getting your, your work read, um, you know, if, if you have a literary agent, some of them actually deal with movie rights, getting your work out there. Um, I used, I, it was a fluke of luck for me. My project, it was actually um, a strange adventure. I was actually doing an interview on MTV and my husband and I were doing a martial arts demonstration because the host of MTV wanted to see what the female character could do. And my husband used one of my books as a weapon. And it stuck in her mind, and she ended up buying the first three books. She fell in love with the characters, and she spent, I think, about three years trying to hunt me down and pursue this, this deal. Um, you know, but if you attend things like writers' conferences, a lot of them bring in people that you can actually pitch your material to. Uh, you know, if you don't have a literary agent who, who specializes in taking your work to um, a producer or a studio, certainly, you know, one way of doing it is a writers' conference that bring in producers that will listen to pitches. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, also, as you say, you've got a novel. Yeah. It's published now, and another one that's coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> famously, Nick Pizzolatto, who did True Detective, had written two books that nobody had ever heard of, but one of them got a little bit of uh, critical notice, and he asked some people, I'd really like to get into writing for television. How do I do that? And they said, send us some scripts. So uh, if you're looking at getting into television, uh, find out who you need to send scripts to, look for what they are interested in seeing. Usually they want a pilot and then uh, a pilot of an original idea or a episode of something that's already done. And they basically judge you on your writing skill, unless they love that pilot, and, uh, and they'll bring you on. Um, I, I have an agent in LA who told me, I can't get any of your movies made, but if you'd be willing to move down here, I can get you work because you're a good enough writer. So he's saying, you know, come down here and write something based on, <laughs> based on the fact that you know how to write. I can't sell any of your scripts, <laughs> <laughs> but I can get you work. And really, that's all, it, I mean, that's all we want, right? We want to get paid for this. I, I do have one word of, of advice. Um, I know there are a number of contests out there where people, um, producers, will run contests where they invite people to submit screenplays in. And, you know, there's awards, there's prizes and all these things and the possibility you might get optioned. Um, be very careful with those. I've seen one, um, and if you look at the tiny fine print on the bottom, Anything you submit becomes their property. 
So they can decline and say, sorry, you didn't win, but, and you know, and yeah, exactly. So be very careful with things like that. But definitely, you know, like I said, a writer's conference is a great place where you can meet people, um, you know, that you can potentially introduce your work to. And remember, I think this is critical. And if you came by my booth, I'm at MM19 downstairs, the third floor. Uh, if you haven't visited yet, you if should. If you haven't visited, I, the guy beside me has got some great stuff. So, uh, but the, the idea here is you have the idea, and you will be pursued by people who don't. And I think it's critical that you defend your territory and your real estate at every step. You be prudent, you be shrewd, and you understand that it is a commodity, not the other way around. And that guy with all the money doesn't have any ideas. That's why he needs you. And that's why he needs every writer in this room. Is because he can't come up with it himself. But he's got some moolah. So you would like some of the moolah, and he really wants all of your ideas. But uh, as Lorna said, cautionary notes every step of the way. Don't fall for any of the traps. Because it's, I know how it is. I mean, you're an artist. You want to be published. Or you want to be printed. You want to be seen. You want to be recognized. Get it. But please. You know, if there's anything I can ever say is, is be true to the work and, of course, be true to its life out in the world after you've created it. And understand that your ideas are wild to you, maybe. I've had this sometimes where I go, that's the best idea ever. <laughs> it's only worth what somebody's going to pay you for it. And um, never be afraid of discussing money. Get a good negotiator on your behalf if you're uncomfortable talking about money. Agent. Absolutely. Um, I don't have an agent, but I can talk for myself. Okay. Uh, anyway, yeah, very important. Please be steady on. We have just a couple of moments left, and uh, Lorna's production company has actually provided us with a press release to have a very uh, special announcement that is going to be deb debuting here. So I will go ahead and read that. Oscar-winning producer joins forces to bring indie authors' epic fantasy to the big screen. Canadian indie author Lorna Suzuki is pleased to announce that Oscar-winning producer Don Carmody has, in, has partnered with independent filmmaker and executive producer Michi Gustava to co-produce the film adaptation of Suzuki's epic fantasy novels The, Amonical, the Imago Chronicles. A Warrior's Tale is the first in a major motion picture trilogy and is expected for worldwide theatrical release in 2015. Best known for the Oscar-winning films Good Will Hunting, The Musical Chicago, and the highly successful Resident Evil franchise, Don Carmody has over 100 films to his credit. His most recent releases include Immortal in The Mortal Instruments, City of Bones, and the big-budget historical drama Pompeii. Ms. Gustavia's production collaboration with this veteran filmmaker promises to immerse audiences in an action-packed, character-driven fantasy world. Casting is underway, with full film production slated to start in fall 2014. Described as Lord of the Rings and 300 meets The Last Samurai, this epic tale has an ensemble, ensemble cast featuring a powerful female central character that is half-elf and half-human. The only one of her kind, she is shunned by one race and denied by the other. This movie trilogy will take the audience, audience on a rollicking adventure in a fantasy world like no other, as this female protagonist climbs from obscurity, finding her place in an unwelcoming world to become a legendary warrior and leader amongst the very people who keep her at arm's length. Thank you for sharing that. So we're going to be adjourning, adjourning to the signing room. If you have any further questions that we were not able to address, please do feel free to join us there. And thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for coming.